president, manager, civil engineering uh, department at uh, Waldemir and Nelson and Company in New Orleans, my good friend from New Orleans who, who invited me and got me involved with his crew of Toth uh, uh, crew and at New Orleans during Mardi Gras. Uh, he is a past president of ACI, having served 2014-15. He's a fellow of ACI, been very active with ACI, uh, member of ASCE, uh, Structural Engineers Institute, SCI, also serves on the ASCE, SCI New Orleans Chapter Executive Committee. And most importantly, he's going to talk about a case where he acted as an expert witness. And I think to this day, he'll tell you that it was a miserable experience and he'll never do it again. So that that is, I think that may be one of the most interesting presentations we have today from a person who acted as an expert and is actually saying it was miserable. I'll never do it again. So for more on that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill. Well, good morning, all. I guess depending on where you are, it certainly is morning where I am um, in New Orleans. And um, as Jeff indicated, um, yeah, for me, this was I, I don't do expert testimony a whole lot. Um, I, I It's not something I do. Uh, on a regular basis. I'm a consulting engineer, but this one kind of uh, put me in a place where I really don't think I want to do expert testimony again. But with that said, Jeff, I just got roped into another one. Um, so anyway, so what I'd like to talk to you uh, today about uh, is a case study, a case that I was involved in. And the, really the case revolved around documentation. Uh, it, it was a concrete project. But the big takeaway here is the issue for this whole thing. So um, where this project took place is just a little bit northeast of New Orleans. Um, you can see New Orleans here. Uh, the Interstate 10 bridge heading towards the northeast. This is actually called Slidell, Louisiana. This is what we refer to as the five mile bridge, um, I-10. So um, what happened, this goes all the way to Hurricane Katrina, um, this bridge suffered severe damage from the tidal surges, waves act, wave actions from Hurricane Katrina. Uh, this bridge was totally destroyed and it was absolutely uh, useless going forward. So a new bridge was commissioned and you can see on the right, this is during construction, the, the new bridge is after Katrina. But here, here is really the case. The case was about the old bridge. So the old bridge was contracted to be demolished. Uh, the Louisiana Department of Transportation contracted, I'm just going to call the contractor, Contractor A. Contractor A was hired to demolish the entire bridge and take all of the concrete and store it on a site. So um, what happened was they started their work. Contractor A started the demolition of this bridge and they were to take all of their materials and dispose of it and to store it on a site over here. So this is actually the site. Uh, this is a Google image of what the site actually looks like today, um, but this is the site. Now, interestingly enough, this is actually a picture of the site um, early 1990s. So kind of the interesting takeaway is this site was all marsh, it was all wetlands, um, all of these canals were dredged, all of the dredged material was stockpiled here on this island and created this island um, around this island is a high-end residential neighborhood. The original plan was this was going to be residential construction. So here is an image during the height of the demolition. So contractor A was hired to take all the concrete and bring it to the northern end of this island. Now, while this was going on, Another, another uh, agency in Louisiana, Department of Environmental Quality, um, in conjunction with a Coastal Protection Restoration Authority, CIPRA, 
contracted with contractor B. Now, contractor B, their function was to take all of the concrete that was coming off of the bridge, and the emphasis is, is all of the concrete, and to use it for mats, um, to create mats to be used in coastal protection. All righty. So um, here are typical mats that are used. These aren't the mats that were placed, but they're very typical. These are baskets that were uh, filled with concrete. So when you look at this site, what happened was contractor B contracted, contract, break it up, hand it over in this area, and then contractor B was going to use this area to create the mats. And you can see mats here under construction and stockpiled materials. So here's what happened. By all accounts, there were 240 to 250,000 tons of concrete coming off of the bridge. Contractor B was responsible for taking all of that concrete and using it, but 62,000 tons of concrete went missing. Because that uh, happened, contractor B had to spend a whole lot of money to buy recycled concrete to make up the differences. Contractor B refused to pay contractor A, and so we had suits and countersuits um, between the two contractors, both suits were over $10 million. They were double figures. Um, what was interesting for me is this is two contractors suing each other. Um, so when you looked at the relationships between them, it was kind of, we're good guys, we're both contractors, we're kind of on the same side. Um, and there was a lot of that with, that went forward. So when this really got down to it, it was all about documentation. And all of the documentation for me, um, as an expert, it was interesting because I saw how all of that documentation was used, what was missing, how missing documents were used uh, going forward. And it was very, very interesting to me. So some of the key documentation that we're going to talk about were the hall tickets, for the concrete used in the transition from contractor A to contractor B. Lots of letters, memos, emails that documented, uh, quote, critical events, meeting minutes, photos, videos, et cetera. All of this was documentation that was key. So the first thing that happened were, of course, emails. And I know Jeff has an email presentation. Um, that talks a lot about emails, but I can tell you emails are absolutely deadly. What we saw in emails were, there were lots of emails that were really not appropriate for email conversations, or there were emails saying, let's meet. And then there was no follow-up to that. There were lots of emails with missing attachments and threads. So what happened was when they got to trial, there was lots of he said, she said, and missing information in uh, con con something to hide. So there was lots of missing emails and documentations relating to that. Further, in meeting minutes, where we had meeting minutes, they were very, very sketchy. Um, they were really cut short concepts rather than detailing all of the meetings that happened during the periods of trying to reconcile the case uh, before suits were filed. There was lots of he said, she said, because the meeting minutes were very choppy in the sense that were uh, the meeting minutes might say something like we met to discuss these issues or when regular meeting minutes were held, there were concepts, um, there was not details. And in trial, it was a case of he said, she said. There were lots of meetings with absolutely no documentation at all. As I said, missing attachments, incomplete thoughts with lots and lots of shortcuts 
um, high level rather than very detailed um, completion of the minutes. Um, as an engineer, we hate meeting minutes. Um, I, I would suspect contractors are very similar and these concepts were very critical uh, to the case in the end. Attendees, this was interesting to me that the attendees at the meetings, no one identified their roles and responsibilities. So what one contractor viewed as a participant with a very high level responsibility, the other party or normally construed them as something as well, no, you're, you're misconstruing what their, what their responsibility was. And that became critical to who is speaking on whose behalf and what their levels of responsibility were. So it was that was a piece of information that no one could come into agreement on what were all the roles and responsibilities of everyone speaking for everyone. Now the truck haul tickets were interesting since we had 62,000 tons of concrete missing. They had haul trucks, dump trucks, carrying concrete from contractor A to contractor B. There were literally thousands of trucks. There was a truck scale on site. What they did is they weighed the first three trucks and they used that as an average for every truck going on afterwards. Many times there weren't even records of, of hauls being made. Um, on a weekly basis, occasionally someone would come along and say, hey, how many trucks were hauled last week? And, and some person on site would say, oh, I think we did five on Saturday, 10 on Sunday, and et cetera. There was no monitoring of, of truck haul tickets. Um, they ended up being woefully inadequate uh, to trying to resolve how much concrete was coming back and forth. Now, what was interesting were the use of words in, in some of the actions trying to reconcile and what caught, what caught my attention, the words um, A and V and how they were construed in emails and minutes, because those are two entirely different words. And engineers are not as good with words as lawyers were, and the lawyers took great advantage of the use of these words by the participants. So very quickly, A and V have two very different meanings. Um, as an example, let's look at this sentence, the car drove silently down the road. And in this specific sentence, the car is a specific car. It's one car and one only. So when we use the word the, we're talking about something very specific. When we talk about a car drove loudly down the road, this can be. So using a and the has big implications when we talk about the solution or a solution or the problem or a problem. There are big differences in these. When we talk about the problem, the solutions, one of the things that came up in court was if you used the word the, the attorneys then asked, that's a singular. So how did you get to all of those conclusions? What was your process for getting to the answer that's very different than a solution or a problem, very different um, very different word uses. And as an engineer um, or a contractor, I don't think we were in tune with that as much as certainly the attorneys were. Now, scraps of paper in the file became something of interest to me um, and what they meant. Uh, contractor B had scraps of paper in his files noting the risk of not having enough concrete delivered from contractor A. And that piece of paper was found during discovery and they were asked, why didn't you manage this? Well, in contractor B's mind, they managed it by hiring contractor A. And there was 
this agreement between them, like I said, came back to haunt contractor B because he identified the risk early and the attorneys presented this case of um, you knew the risk. So scraps of paper in the files, they were really meaningless and came to hurt. Spreadsheets, um, what became in critical, a critical spreadsheet from the contractor became a problem. Uh, the questions asked were, who created the spreadsheets? And the contractor said, I did. Who checked it? Well, I checked it. Um, who input the data? I did. Who checked it? Well, I did. What was interesting on spreadsheets is these got dismissed in court um, they were declared biased because the same person who created them checked them. There was no secondary checks to the data. There was no checks to the spreadsheet creation. Um, there was no uh, documentation of when these sheets were created, and therefore they were deemed as biased. And I know that Jeff has talked about uh, this necessarily wouldn't apply in all courts in all places, but in this case, um, it was actually dismissed and it was a critical piece of evidence that was not allowed to be utilized. So in closing, um, documentation was really critical. It was very inadequate. There was a lot of trust going on um, and it was based on everyone doing the right thing and that necessarily wasn't wasn't what was going on. Um, there were lots of emails with missing information. Minutes of meetings were not adequate. Um, they were sketchy. They didn't define. And all of this was dissected. All of those words are important. Um, and what I'd like you to take away is the details matter. We really hate doing documentation. I know as an engineer, I absolutely despise the documentation. I'd rather be doing the engineering, but um, it was really critical to this case uh, that the documentation was right and it wasn't right and it really created some negative outcomes.